Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. These are my disclosures. Okay, so patients with uveitis, as you've heard, have a very high uh, risk of complications. It's one of the main leading causes of visual loss, and their complications occur because of the recurrent flares of uveitis. Our goal when treating uveitis is to eliminate all inflammation and induce a steroid-free remission. Most of the complications that we talk about are cataracts, glaucoma, and cystoid macular edema. So those are the main ones that we want to avoid to prevent this visual loss. Which immunosuppression to use? So you've heard already in the previous talk, and uh, I'll uh, go quickly through the slides that touch on some of the similar topics. But generally, this is how we approach uveitis. So we start off with the local and topical drops, uh, depending on whether it's an anterior uveitis or not. I mean, of course, if it's an intermediate or more posterior uveitis, we move on to uh, perhaps regional therapy, as long as the patient doesn't have a steroid response. And then we give the patient a course of systemic uh, steroids before starting immunosuppression. So this talk will be more about immunosuppression. And you've heard about the uh, first-line immunosuppressors, the conventional immunosuppressive treatment. And if those are not effective in about three to six months, then we consider biologic agents. We group the biolog biologic agents into first line, we would call them first line biologics, like the anti-TNF agents, and then the second line biologic agents. This is an international in initiative called the FOCUS Initiative, and the publication came out at the beginning of 2018. It was an international group uh, that developed, uh, that reviewed the literature, did a systematic review, and uh, then did a consensus uh, Delphi exercise to come up with clear evidence base and practical information for clinicians who manage systemic treatment of uveitis. And the publication came in the form of 21 guidance statements in three areas of clinical focus. And those areas were optimal timing for treatment escalation, uh, transitioning to a non-corticosteroid immunosuppressive and collaboration in the multidisciplinary disciplinary care team. And I'll be touching on the results of this, this publication throughout my talk. So one of the questions, this is in the second area of clinical focus in uh, the focus report, touched on how to select non-corticosteroid immunosuppressive therapy. And the first grouping uh, of agents was the conventional agents, and uh, the medical evidence and the systematic review, as well as the uh, consensus exercise, supported the use of methotrexate, mycophenolate, mofetil, azathioprine, tacrolimus, and cyclosporin for use of patients with uh, uveitis. The question is when to start immunosuppression. And again, we've talked about uh, what to look for uh, when starting immunosuppression, uh, when patients are not controlled if they're with those regional uh, therapies or with a course of oral corticosteroids. But if patients continue to have active inflammation despite the use of the conventional immunosuppressives and they're develop st developing structural complications or they're intolerant to their medications, then we consider biologics. And the, this is the second line immunosuppression and we'll just take a step back here and talk about what are biologics. Uh, so biologic agents are recombinant proteins or antibodies that target a specific arm of the immune system. They're monoclonal antibodies that are usually directed towards cytokines or cell surface receptors. And because they are so specific, they produce a rapid onset of action and quicker control of inflammation with higher success rates. I mentioned that the first-line biologic agents, the older, oldest biologic agents that have been around are the anti-TNF agents, and they were developed in uh, 1998, first approved for use in Crohn's disease, actually, the infliximab, uh, which is the, the oldest one around, uh, and first reported to be used in uveitis in 2001. Adalimumab, which is a fully humanized monoclonal anti-TNF agent, was first approved for use of, in rheumatoid arthritis and, uh, and then used in uveitis in 2007. So the reason why they're so effective is they function both innate and adaptive immunity, and uh, there's and studies have shown a large amount of uh, TNF being circulated in patients with active uveitis. The focus report also uh, reviewed the literature on which biologic agents are effective in uveitis, and a grade A level recommendation was given for adalimumab, which is the fully humanized anti-TNF agent, and it is a medication which is given subcutaneously every two weeks. Infliximab was supported with grade B level recommendation, and it is dosed uh, every four to six weeks through IV infusion. 
The other biologics you've just heard about in the previous talks are the interferons, and they're used uh, more often in Bechet's disease, and interferon beta can be used in intermediate uveitis. And we don't use them as often here in Canada, but uh, uh, they're used much more in Europe. Those second-line biologic agents that I mentioned previously are, there, there are multiple uh, anti-cytokine biologic agents that are, have been used in rheumatology and gastroenterology. Um, there's only a few that have been shown to have sustained effect for patients with uveitis, and those include the anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, or atuximab, anti-IL-6, tocilizumab, and the interferons, which I've mentioned. The other ones uh, haven't shown a sustained response, but uh, there are still some studies that are uh, looking at uh, whether a different dosing, for example, uh, secukinibag given, given IV might work perhaps better than subcutaneously. So the reason why adalimumab was given a grade A level recommendation in the focus report is that there are three randomized controlled trials that are now uh, have been published supporting the use of adalimumab in uveitis. The visual program was a program which was developed to uh, randomize controlled trials to uh, examine the safety and efficacy of adalimumab in active uveitis, that was the visual one study, in active uveitis, the visual two study, and in open label extension, which was the visual three study. And the visual one and visual two studies uh, looked at primary efficacy endpoints. So the uh, main endpoint was the time to treatment failure. And treatment failure was defined as development of new chorioretinal lesions, uh, the inability to quiet the anterior chamber of vitreous haze, and loss of visual acuity. Results of the visual one study showed that the risk to fail in patients treated with adalimumab versus placebo was reduced by 50%. Uh, and the median time to treatment failure was 13 weeks in the placebo group versus 24 weeks in the adalimumab group. And so these, this is in patients with active uveitis going into the study. Uh, patients with inactive uveitis treated with adalimumab uh, were found to have a decreased risk of uveitis flare or loss of visual acuity with time to treatment failure extended from 4.8 months to 10.2 months. So notice this is not a cure for uveitis. Patients still flare, but the time to flare is extended when patients are treated with uh, adalimumab. The visual three uh, study key outcomes were that about, if you look at the table here, it's a little busy, but about 70% of patients who entered the study in visual three, those are the patients who had failed visual one and visual two and continued in this long-term extension study, 70% of those patients were quiescent by 78 weeks. And 80% of those patients were quiet, 80% of patients with inactive uveitis going into the study were quiescent by 78 weeks. And one of the key uh, findings here is that adalimumab uh, did not lose effect over time. So looking at these first-line biologic agents, what is the success rate? Well, it does vary across the various study, but it's, uh, studies, but it's about 40 to 80 or 90 percent for the anti-TNF adalimumab and infliximab agents. And it takes about 6 to 12 weeks for uveitis to be controlled with the anti-TNF agents. It's a little quicker, perhaps, with adalimumab. For the second-line biologic agents, the information here is from mostly uh, is from pros smaller prospective and retrospective studies. And tocilizumab achieves a level of control of about 70% of patients who have failed previous anti-TNF, and the time to control is about six to nine months. Rituximab can achieve control initially in a large number of patients, but a certain number of patients will relapse at three months. And interferon alpha 2A can achieve even remission in 50% of patients, but there is a high uh, risk of side effects uh, when patients are treated with the interferons. The next question is when to start immunosuppression. So we need markers. What do we look for? How do we make that decision when we're faced with a patient who has inflammation or uveitis? Uh, we need to look to see whether the patient had, has impaired visual function, whether they have bilateral disease. Severe inflammation is also defined as vitreous haze, macular optic nerve disease, retinal vascular inflammation, macular edema, or exudative detachment. Also, patients with recurrent or chronic disease are considered to have severe disease. So these are all reasons to consider starting an, a systemic immunosuppressive agent. Biologics, the anti-TNF agents, are usually used as second-line treatment for a wide variety of indications in the uveitis, but sometimes we can also use them as first-line agents. For example, in Bechet's disease, patients who have severe vision-threatening or debilitating uveitis, so patient, these patients have occlusive vasculopathy and can be a very high risk of visual loss. 
You can consider using anti-TNF earlier if patients have um, recurrent or chronic CME. But what do we do if the anti-TNF is not effective? So there are a certain proportion of patients who are not going to respond to those uh, primary uh, uh, first-line biologic agents. So there's a few options. One is to escalate the dose, to increase the dose of infliximab, or you can even increase the dose of adalimab, or dose them more frequently, so every four weeks rather than every eight weeks, uh, or weekly uh, for, uh, in the case of adalimumab. The other option is to switch to another anti-TNF uh, agent like golimumab or sertilizumab. Uh, the third option is to combine uh, a, a biologic agent with an anti-metabolite or also add some local treatments. And sometimes in intermediate uveitis, for example, you can debulk the inflammation and uh, consider a surgical option. But if all those options have been exhausted and they're not working, then you may need to move on to a second line biologic agent. How do we do immunosuppression? Well, you've heard a lot already in the previous talk, so I won't repeat everything, but one of the main things to do, of course, is to evaluate your patient, make sure they don't have a systemic inflammatory disease, because that will direct the choice of immunosuppressive. Um, also, it's very important to rule out demyelinating disease, especially in patients with intermediate uveitis, because 5% of intermediate uveitis can be caused by multiple sclerosis, and you want to make sure to avoid anti-TNF and anti-IL-6 agents in patients with demyelinating disease. You need to do a review of the hematologic system, the hepatorenal system. Most immunosuppressives are uh, metabolized by the liver and kidney, so make sure uh, that the function is uh, normal and uh, review other body systems, the bone health, and it must be uh, monitored in patients who are being treated with any steroids systemically. Uh, also rule out malignancy, premalignant lesions. Uh, infections can be exacerbated by our immunosuppressive treatments, so make sure to rule those, those out before starting um, the immunosuppressives. And also the family planning discussions come <laughs> in the ophthalmologist's office quite often as well, patients, mostly women of childbearing age, so that will also direct the choice of uh, immunosuppression. But what if, again, looking back, every time we uh, have a patient where we are treating them and the treatment is not working, we need to stop for a moment and reevaluate and make sure that the uh, patient is compliant with our treatment. We have to reconsider the diagnosis. Are we missing an infection? Are we missing a masquerade syndrome? Does the patient have another etiology that's uh, not inflammatory for their uveitis? When treating patients, uh, uh, their blood work needs to be monitored every two to four weeks initially, and then that can be extended to uh, every two months once they're stable. Uveitis exams have to be frequent, so about four to six weeks after initiating an immunosuppressive or biologic agent. And then once they're controlled, again, extending the uh, follow-up, but patients need to be monitored regularly to make sure that uh, the treatment is effective. How do we define success? Well, ideally, we want all eyes to become quiescent. So we are trying to achieve an inactive disease state or, or drug-induced remission. So that means while on the immunosuppressive agent, no inflammation, which means less than zero to five cells in the anterior chamber, a quiet vitreous, or at least a decrease in two-step two decrease in the level of inflammation. And also, we want to see a quiescence of the vasculitis or the choroiditis. This is an example of a patient with very active burden shot uh, retinochoroidopathy with vasculitis and cystoid macular edema in, on presentation. And after, uh, uh, it took a, f a while to get her CME under control, but after a year of treatment and, uh, and modifying her various immunosuppressives, she became quiescent. And this is one of her uh, recent uh, pictures showing the choroidal lesions are well-defined. They're not active anymore. There's no vasculitis and there's no vitritis. We want to also achieve corticosteroid sparing success, and ideally having patients on absolutely no steroids. Sometimes that is not possible, but we want to eliminate steroids ideally and use less than three drops of topical steroids per day or no topical steroids per day. How long does it take to achieve treatment success? You've already heard. So it takes uh, at least six to eight weeks to, uh, to start to see improvement. But with the anti-metabolites, probably about four to six months to achieve control of the uveitis. And again, I've mentioned it's a little quicker with the biologic agents, about six to 12 weeks for those.
how long do we treat with uh, systemic immunosuppression? We want to uh, have a relapse free, free remission. So that means no flares while on treatment for two years before tapering. And when we do taper, we usually taper gradually over the course of three to 12 months before we get patients uh, off immunosuppression. It's not always possible. We always need to individualize this decision, balancing the risk of uh, longer-term immunosuppression versus the risk of uveitis flare and loss of vision if the uveitis should flare. Who should be administering the immunosuppression? Well, I do be strongly believe in a shared model of uveitis care, which involves both ophthalmology and rheumatology. Uh, the ophthalmologist uh, is the first uh, caregiver who sees the patient usually, and the, the job there, the, our role, is to diagnose the uh, uveitis, and at least if we can't find an etiology, at least define what the anatomical location of the uveitis is, because that helps our, uh, that can direct our investigations and also then helps the rheumatologist to do further investigations. So sending patients to the rheumatologist saying, investigate for a uveitis, is it's just not enough information. We really need to communicate that information and we need to continue seeing the patient and communicating with the rheumatology to achieve um, the best treatment uh, and best management for the patient. We do, uh, I work very closely with rheumatologists to initiate and monitor immunosuppression uh, once uh, for, pay, for my patients with uveitis. Uh, the focus report also uh, supported this, and uh, they uh, stated that the collaboration in a multidisciplinary care team optimizes diagnosis and therapy and improves patient outcomes. So in summary, we've talked about indications and treatment for, system, uh, for uveitis, starting with conventional immunosuppression, uh, moving on to biologic agents uh, if the conventional immunosuppressives are not effective. All patients need to have a pretreatment organ evaluation and investigations. Uh, ruling out infection and malignancy, and this collaboration between ophthalmology and rheumatology, I believe, optimizes patient outcomes. Thank you.